This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The transformation of the last of the city's massive housing projects tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Rosalind Willis from McCormick Baron Salazar, one of the main developers on the project. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Maura Black Sullivan, the interim executive director with Memphis Housing Authority. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Archie Willis, president of Community Capital. You'll be a local partner in the project. Thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me. And Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. So let me, I guess, I don't know where to start. I'm gonna start with you, Maura. Um, Talk about the scope of the project. Um, this is Foot Homes, I should probably introduce for people who haven't seen it. The last of what, 10 major public, nine or 10 major public housing projects mm -hmm. that have been transformed one by one, going back to the Harrington administration. This was mm -hmm. the last one. Uh, starts with a $30 million grant from the federal government. I think you all are talking about upwards of $300 million total right. of investment. Right. Um, Talk about the scope of how, how many units, when it'll start, when it'll be done. Just give us a, a picture of that. Right, right. This is um, our last traditional red brick public housing in Memphis. We do have other public housing neighborhoods um, in, throughout Memphis, um, some high rises, but this will be our last traditional red brick public housing. It has, it's um, just south of the South Main area near um, the FedEx Forum. It is, um, we have about a thousand residents there and it, um, we have been so lucky and just so blessed to receive this grant from the federal government that'll give us um, the money to demolish those units um, that, are, that are old and, and need to go and create uh, better housing for the residents and for new residents to be a part of that community. And what, red brick, clarify what that means when you say red brick housing. Yeah, it's, um, so it is literally made of red brick and it, it does hearken, that gives you the idea in your head of that um, traditional public housing look. Two stories, Two story. how many units in them when you, you know, eight or something, it seems yes, like. Yes, yes, so they're, thing, okay. they, it's a little, um, uh, a pod, so yeah. to speak, of, and those, of uh, units. People think of uptown, people maybe think of, was it uh, Soulsville, Souls, uh, what's, what's the one near Soulsville? Uh, College Park. College Park. Park. And so people who've seen this, but one place. by one. Archie, you've been involved in how many of these? I've been involved with all of the redevelopment of public housing except for College Park. I okay. was not involved with College Park. So Uptown, which actually consisted of two public housing developments, the old Lauderdale Courts, which is now Uptown Square, Hurt Village, which is the Metropolitan Apartments, Lamar Terrace, which is now University Place, uh, Dixie Homes, which is now Legends Park, and Claiborne Homes, which is now Claiborne Point at Heritage Landing. Yeah. Why is it important to do this? It's important for a number of reasons. I think you start with the fact that the folks that live there deserve better housing. And it's just uh, over time, uh, the, the resources, the environment around the, the neighborhoods has changed from uh, when these housing complex were, complexes were originally built. So we really have to re revitalize the neighborhoods. We have to provide decent, safe, quality, affordable housing for residents. And you think about public housing and where it's located, it really was a circle or a semicircle around downtown. So it also provides just greater opportunities for additional redevelopment in the inner city. Yeah. Rosalind, so the, you've been involved in how many, a couple of those? Well, I was involved in Uptown under the Tara Lee Bells partnership and um, joined the McCormick Baron Salazar team to work on University Place and Legends Park. And there's, I mean, just from a, you know, I, I guess I drive by some of them, and from an aesthetic point of view, it's clearly this beautiful improvement. You go from something that looks very distressed and something that looks kind of institutional to suddenly neighborhoods. Right. Um, but beyond that, I mean, what does it mean in terms of mixed income, and are they all rentals? Are they own, some own some rentals or some apartments? Can you give maybe some sense of the mix of housing that goes that will go in and has gone into the other ones? Yes, all of the uh, developments that we do, McCormick Barron has been doing this for 40 years, and 
I won't say they invented mixed income, but they certainly um, were at the forefront of the concept and worked with HUD early on with the, even the development of the HOPE uh, concept. And so it is uh, an attempt to go back to what I would consider traditional neighborhoods where there could be attorneys, the postman, the school teachers, um, maintenance per worker from uh, office building, all in the same block, block excuse me. And um, so we got a sort of a, a, not really a formula, but a performa that where we can say X amount of public housing residents, X amount of affordable units, and X amount of market rate units to sort of blend in the economics and make the projects work. Because they were an alternative bill. I mean, public housing, in the past, I don't know who wants to take this, but became unintentionally, or wait, I, there's all kinds of politics, but these kind of isolated areas of poverty, right. and they became kind of traps, not is that correct? I mean, and so that's what this is trying to get away from, that yeah, history of trapping poverty and then these kind of criminal um, that came with the poverty and so right. on. That's correct. And I think, um, you know, as planners, we've learned through the years that you've, um, that there are different ways to create housing and there are different ways to create neighborhoods. And at one time, people did look at neighborhoods as being um, a place where you um, should have coves and um, isolated areas, really. And now we've learned that you have a better neighborhood when you have a throughput, when you have um, connectivity to, to the, each side and throughout. At one time, you, it was thought that you could create more um, a, a safer area if you didn't have throughways. And now right. we've really learned that you're safer with throughways. Yeah, yeah, Bill. So, what happens during the demolition? When does demolition start and, and what happens to the people who live in foot homes? Um, one thing that we're really excited about with this plan, you know, we've, we've been lucky to have five, five um, units or five projects done before. So we've learned with each one and we've learned that if we can start housing on an offsite place before, um, that will allow us to bring some residents to um, the new housing that we create off-site. And so we can create some relocation right on, right on site with the new development. Um, so we'll I'll let Rosalind speak about that more as part of the development team, but that's, um, mm -hmm. that's one piece that we think is gonna help us to be more successful in relocation this time. It is a challenge. Um, and um, one of the comments I made at the press conference was to like, let people know, you know, don't get discouraged. We want you to, you know, to come back. Um, and, I, you know, I, I can't imagine, you know, what that must feel like. But it's necessary that we, you know, do the demolition. And our preference is to demolish the entire site so that people aren't living around the construction. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing that's part of this program we have quite a few residents, but we do have um, vouchers that a project that we will place in some of the developments in the downtown area. And so some residents off the bat would be able to move into either homes that have already been built or that are under construction and move into what's now HUD's calling areas of opportunity. And so we've got to fine tune that, but that, that was part of our plan. Mm -hmm. Let me just add another comment to that. <clears throat> Claiborne Point, which is directly across the street, as you all know, is under construction. We're working on the final phase, phase four of it, and it'll be completed by the end of the year. So literally, people will have an opportunity to move from foot to Claiborne if they choose to, because units are being constructed, as Rosalind said, as we speak. Uh, we'll have uh, additional units that become available as other people move out. So that's another benefit. It's not a lot of units. The, uh, the final phase is 67 units, but folks will have, and they do have priority, they will have an opportunity to move literally across the street into a new housing unit if they choose to. Mm -hmm. In addition to the, the off-site development, which actually won't come online until probably 2017. So, you know, we're trying to look at different ways and take advantage of the current environment at Claiborne to create opportunities for people to relocate in the neighborhood 
And in those, in, the, in those cases, they wouldn't have to move again, presumably. Once they move into a unit at Claiborne, you know, hopefully they, everything works out, they're happy, and they can stay there for as long as they choose to. Mm -hmm. right. And, and we should tell our viewers that, that Lauderdale has, has been the boundary between foot homes and what was Claiborne homes. And at one point they were mirror images of each other just on different sides of Lauderdale. Uh, now there is a stark difference with what is happening with Claiborne Point at, at Heritage right. Landing and, and Foot Homes. It's like a before and an after picture on each side. So I take it that, that uh, what comes next at Foot Homes will look uh, uh, along the same scale as what we see at Claiborne Point. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I want to just add quickly is that we're here, we're on the ground here already at University Place and uh, as well as um, Legends Park. There's also, uh, as part of our sort of larger team, um, Henry. And so... Henry Turley. Henry yeah. Turley. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's an opportunity to also uh, feed into those developments as people move out. And I know that there's a commitment from our management company to let MHA know when we have uh, vacancies and that people can move into those communities that have already been transformed and, and still have a, a, a nice place to live. So this, it's a lot of coordination, a lot of moving parts, but there are options that heretofore have not been available. How much of of what you have planned for this is part of the evolution from when we started with this in 1998 with Lemoyne Gardens, which is now College Park. How, how much have we learned over this this period of these conversions? I'm gonna let you answer that one. <laughs> I want to believe we've learned a whole lot, as Mara mentioned. Uh, clearly, the the focal point of all these initiatives are the residents and the people that live there now and they will live there in the future. And I think we've learned a lot about how do you manage that process? Mm -hmm. How do you recognize the challenges and obstacles that come with this process? Things that, frankly, we would all take for granted are challenges in a lot of these people's lives. So how do you navigate that? So things like transportation. Transportation, utilities. Utility, yeah. utilities, it's, utilities it's, that's really a big deal because they, they don't pay utilities at public housing. Right. That's part of the rent payment. So you're saying, here's this voucher. You go find a nice place to live somewhere else. And all of a sudden, you have a utility bill that right. you heretofore were not accustomed to having to pay. So it's just, it's, you know, it's just, yeah. a, it's just a different kind of, uh, of financial responsibility. And again, we take it for granted, but for somebody that's not, that's not had to have this burden yeah. for five, six, seven, whatever number of years, it's just something you have to manage. And, and the, I mean, some of the criticism or the pushback on, on these projects in the past was that, I mean, these are people's homes. They're vested in this neighborhood. It may be um, that, you know, I drive by and I think that looks institutional and, and degraded, whatever I described it before, but that's someone's home and maybe they've spent a whole lot of time there. And so there was sort of a pushback that there was a lack of sensitivity to that. I mean, do you look back and think, yeah, we probably, maybe we could have done that better in terms of just the, the sense that we're all, we're all doing a ribbon cutting to tear down someone's home. Right, right. I think there was some lack of sensitivity. It's, it's certainly not intentional. It's just, again, part of the process. Yeah. You try something for the first time, you don't really know how to do it. Yeah. And you learn from the experience and you try to do it better the next time and the next time and the next time. So I think there was always the sensitivity in terms of people's hearts, in terms of how they want to interact with the residents and make it as a uh, as comfortable as possible, but you know there are other realities that just enter into right. the process. And then the other side of it that people totally disregard is this is a federal grant. It comes with federal regulations and yes. guidelines, and you have to play yeah. by Wires their rules. And, and their rules don't always necessarily right. uh, you know, line up with uh, how you would do something if you had right. total uh, oversight over the process. Let me maybe this is a question for you. You know, again, we talk about the aesthetics and we talk about the, the feel of these new neighborhoods being. Successful, but what about the? I mean, is there a is there a change in crime? Is there a change in? Um, I mean, the, the, what are the sort of changes statistically or mm -hmm. or quantitatively in those neighborhoods? There has been a tremendous change in crime, and one of the things that we've um, that we've also learned um, in in this process is that when we are that we need to set people up for success, that we have not always done that, 
And um, so when they're the first things that came, the first um, projects that came to fruition, we didn't see as many changes. And each one, we've seen more statistical changes in crime and employment numbers, et cetera. So one of the things that we're looking at um, that we've done with this project is that we've uh, applied first for a Jobs Plus grant, and we're successful in getting that. And what that is going to do is allow us to um, put layers and layers of um, job seeking assistance in place for the resident, the current residents of Foot Homes. Right now, of our residents, of our adult residents of Foot Homes, um, a little more than half are not employed. But it's important to note that 80% of those adults who are not employed are women with children. So that's something to, to really, um, those are things that you've got to look at. You've got to, um, when you're preparing people for, for work and opportunities for work, those opportunities also include childcare. And so we've, that's another piece of this puzzle that we're putting together is a, an early childhood center on site in this in this development. So we're we've learned a lot um, for ways to to create right. better opportunities. What about uh, do you work with Mata in this kind of situation? Does, does Mata do, are there already bus routes there, or do you say, well, you know, can we get better bus routes? I mean, everyone, mm -hmm. you know, everyone wants. We've talked a lot in the, the debate, the, the the campaign about inadequate transportation. It, will there be changes as part of? I that? don't know if there will be changes or what degree the changes. <laughs> will be, but MATA is certainly a partner in the process. They were a partner with the application. They've been at the table uh, as a part of the discussions throughout mm -hmm. the process. Uh, the, and it's not necessarily a MATA piece, but the, the main to main connector, if you look at the, the actual route, there is a piece that kind of meanders up to foot homes. Mm -hmm. And main, <coughs> that was main is, the, is the big federal grant that take, goes all the way to the downtown Bridge, Bridge, right, right, across right. all the lanes. It's People have been downtown seeing all this sort of transformation right. of the streetscape and the repaving and so on. That's right? correct. And so that's providing. That will come to, over to. That comes over to Foot Homes. And it was okay. intentionally drawn right. off of Main Street to, to go into the neighborhood. Right. So things like that are important. Uh, they will look at bus routes and, 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 and the bus shelters and just make sure we can do improvements. And, and, and actually, we're looking at some different transportation models. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the expert on that, but I know Matt and the city are looking mm -hmm. at different right. transportation models. You wanted to add something? Yeah, just um, actually bus um, routes through the neighborhood are, are really well, are, you know, are pretty good. What, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'd like to see is we're bisected by, um, Danny Thomas. Danny, Danny Thomas. Thomas. And then what's the, the, no, it's Danny Thomas. So it would be great. We'll have a senior building there. And we've kind of got a little plaza area we're looking at. It would be great. Maybe the bus could come there so that seniors can, you right. know, have immediate access to, to getting on the buses, et cetera. And um, again, I think the, the great thing about this that's a lessons learned is that we are focusing on the neighborhood as opposed to the site. Mm -hmm. um, Hope Six's focus was on the, the public housing site and the transformation of that. And so CNI is, is HUD's answer to, okay, this is great, but what a, what's ha about what's happening across, across the street, the street. Mm -hmm. okay. around yeah. the corner? So HUD learned, yeah, like so we HUD say learned. that we have yes, learned, HUD exactly. learned as well. And, and so, so they should, instead of the Hope Six projects, they now call it the CNI Choice Neighborhood, Choice Neighborhood Initiative, Initiatives, yes, uh, which does broaden your scope into yeah. the neighborhood. Does that put federal money outside the site, or does that? Yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Okay, and I think it's a, just a tremendous improvement and a great opportunity. And I mean, we couldn't have pick, picked a better site to have this happen mm -hmm. on because we're so close to so many access, ac <coughs> excuse me, amenities right. and um, job centers. Right. Yeah. yeah it's well, and I was going to say, so you well, you were on the show, we we're trying to think sometime in the last year, because you're involved with this, uh, the, the Central Station Correct. project. So that's not a federal project at all, except for the, the Amtrak component. But it's a private development, yeah, apartments, private. Henry Turley, and so on. This connects to that in a way, because sometimes some of the other projects that have been redone are still a little bit of islands, I guess. But right. this one, I guess, you guys have talked about, it has the potential to hook into everything that's going into South Maine, right? That's Economically, correct. Economically, yes. grocery store, yes. all that kind of yes. stuff. That's absolutely correct. And, and you know, we've been very intentional about how the train station evolves. And, and the way I look at it, and I think Henry agrees, is the train station now is a barrier from what I call the affluent west side 
of South Maine, mm -hmm. the very affluent west side of South Maine, yeah. to the very, uh, less affluent east side of South Maine. Right. So the transformation of the train station, some of the things that we're looking at will, we think, bridge that gap right. and start connecting those two communities together so you can create interaction right. and activities on both sides of the train station. Yeah, okay. Right. And I, was, I was just going to say I'm smiling because it's just so exciting. I mean, it really is to have the, um, to really see the connections, I mean, to have South Main and to have everything that's happening around the pyramid. And then you've got the Main Street Mall and you've really got a downtown that is becoming more connected. Beale Street, the FedEx Forum, and then this area just just to the south of the FedEx Forum, and then this is all going to connect. Then with Uptown, those two sides, then connect to the um, right. to the medical center, and to Midtown, right. and we're really creating a cohesive and coordinated inner core for our city. Okay, so all the people who live downtown or are moving downtown want to know when there's going to be a grocery store. You want to break news? When, when's that, who's going to break the news? When is the grocery I mean, it is, people ask, talk about this whole grocery it store. It is a part of this plan, and it is a part of the Uptown plan, and we are all still working as hard as we can to get it okay. there. Bill, just about five minutes left. Okay. Um, it, so, so, so much of what we know as downtown ha has changed, especially going, going south. And this actually moves into South Memphis itself. So, so what's, what's kind of the domino effect of this in terms of the interest in the areas around foot homes, uh, but not in foot homes? That's the whole, that's the point of this grant. That's the choice neighborhood um, initiative work that, the, that HUD challenges the cities to do when they get this money. And we are, um, as, I, as I just said, we are so um, uniquely geographically situated to influence what happens in downtown, but we are also, as you just said, the gateway to South Memphis and the gateway to Soulsville and the whole area around Lamoan. And so we've got um, College Park and University Place that we'll connect to, and it just, it just opens that area up for tourism and um, for the connections between our Heritage Trail and all of the, the amazing historical tourism opportunities that we'll have between um, Claiborne Temple and Lamoan and Mason. I mean, we've just, it's, it's really an exciting project because it opens and connects so much of our history and our future. Mm -hmm. This was originally called Triangle Noir. It was originally called uh, Heritage Trails. Now it's, it's South City. How has the concept evolved over that time? Well, I guess I'll take responsibility for <laughs> South City. Um, we weren't involved in sort of those prior um, initiatives, but in thinking about where we are and actually knowing that South Memphis was a city at one point in time, and I just started playing around, just kept saying South. Well, we don't want to be named the neighborhood South Memphis because that it needs to have a unique brand and a unique position within the overall scheme of things. And I just kept saying, I said, South City, I like South City. And so, you know, we had to have a name for the grant, and it kind of stuck, and I think it has taken off, and we've gotten a lot of positive response uh, to, to that idea. And to answer your question, I think we'll see things start to move toward Crump. There are all mm -hmm. kinds of great uh, warehouses. Uh, you know, they all look kind of nasty right now, but I think that logically you're going to have, you know, creative, uh, younger people wanting to, do, you know, see things uh, well, It's like the lot space that's going in to a warehouse not far, right, right between right. Yeah, the art space. Right, the art right. Space project. right. Yeah. So. And so... No, going north, I think that's all pretty, you know, all the way up to uptown, we're in good shape. I think we'll begin to see um, revitalization going south. I think that will be the next frontier. But, I, you know, I, I, I'd like to say let's get this well underway mm -hmm. and have people move into the area, then let's tackle another neighborhood. Yeah. And I think that would be South Memphis. Um, you are interim director because Robert Lipscomb is not in the position right now. I'm not right. going to ask you about the investigation or anything. But what, what is it like right now? Um, he has been a figure. He's led this transformation of all these houses, of, mm -hmm. of housing projects, um, mm -hmm. of all kinds of other things that he's credited with in terms of transforming downtown that we're talking about. Is it 
strange to be in the office and he's not there? I mean, he's been a very powerful, influential figure for he a is. long time. He is, and a, and a friend, too. You know, I've worked in public life my whole career and have worked with Robert my whole career. And um, what I have, I have luckily worked with the staff for years and know um, just about everybody there already. And um, I have told everyone that let's, let's honor the best way that we can honor the work that Robert has done and the legacy that Robert has created for this city is to keep it going. And, and was so there at any doing. point where that you were concerned that the, 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 the grant would get held up because of there's an investigation going on? I mean, was that discussed in the in the application process in the last few months? Sure, uh, just in the last month. You know, this, they were um, already HUD was already at the um, at the review process, so um, we did have um, some phone calls made to HUD um, to let everyone know that we're moving forward. And, right. Is there an um, audit underway? I mean, that was talked about of, of MHA. That was talked about as part of this. We need to look and do an audit and make sure where funds we are gone. We are doing that. Um, we're doing that at, at MHA and at Housing Community Development, both entities. Who does the audit? Um, we have an outside firm, um, CBiz is their okay. name, and um, they're okay. doing the, the audit. Okay. You've worked with Robert. You've got about 15 seconds left. Is it hard to do this without him? It is. It is. You, um, yes, it's Amara said he's a friend. I've known Robert for a very long time, even before we got involved with this effort. And it, it's uh, certainly a different, a different dynamic. All right. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Your laryngitis, you held, your voice held up. I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night.